We're going to talk today about a phenomenon known as standing waves. This is just an interesting effect that occurs because of wave interference. You can see this for yourself if you had a, a rope and you could tie it up to a wall somewhere and if you shake it just right, you can kind of make it look like if you look just at the outer ends, the outer edges, like a wave, the inner parts will be kind of fuzzy looking and then the bottom part looks like another wave. And there's a place right in the middle where the rope will appear not even to move. This is called a standing wave. The reason why we're interested in standing waves is they do account for certain phenomenon, one of which I'm sure you're very interested in, which is music. This is how musical notes are often made. They also do things like make laser beams. So that's kind of interesting. Standing waves can only be produced under uh, very precise conditions, which depends on what the medium is. Is it a rope? Is it the air? Is it the, you know, um, electromagnetic vibrations might uh, do this in, in, you know, space or something, but you have to have just the right frequency and the right conditions to set these things up. So I'm going to show you a demonstration of one now. So basically what we have here, this is a frequency generator, this box in the very front. And then there's a rope and it's tied to a, uh, a way to shake it up and down just a little. Um, it's actually a speaker. So you can control the exact vibrational frequency. And so we let's turn on the frequency generator here and, and we don't have to use his actual numbers, but let's just pretend like he's shaking it at some random vibrational frequency of let's say 17. Okay. So, you know, it just looks like a shaking rope, nothing much special going on. And now what we're going to do is we're going to set it to a very particular frequency, which he's determined ahead of time to be, let's call that 10. That is a standing wave. You see how the outline of it looks like a wave? The inner part's all fuzzy, but the outsides look like a wave on top and then another wave on bottom. And then there's a part right in the center where the wave is not moving at all. It's kind of an interesting feature of a standing wave called a node. And if you put your finger right above and below it, the wave keeps going and the rope won't touch you. You can actually grab the rope and the wave keeps going. So that's kind of an interesting effect of waves is that the energy is what's moving, not really the particles. So even if the particles are sitting still, the energy can still pass through them. This is in slow motion and it just shows you there's a wave going down and then a wave being reflected back. But when you look at it in high speed, you can see that part in the center, that node that's staying still. Now this was at a frequency of about, let's call it 10. If you cut that frequency in half, let's see what happens. So here's a frequency of five. And again, we have a standing wave here, but this time, instead of having an entire wave, what you have is only half of a wave. This is called the fundamental for this particular setup where you have two ends of a rope tied off. This is the fundamental frequency. So if it's at five, when we turned it up to 10, we had a full wavelength. Here's half a wavelength. If you turn it up to five, you have a full wavelength. If you turn it up to 15, let's see what happens. So there's 10 and there's 15. So every time you have an integer, integer multiple of that fundamental frequency. Remember the fundamental was five, so here's 15. You get another half of a wavelength in this particular setup. Now I keep saying this particular setup because it does matter whether the ropes are tied down on the ends or not. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So if this is 15, what would happen if you went up to say 30? Well, let's find out. That's the slow-mo video. You, Again, if you kind of look right here, 
And right here, you can see that those parts of the rope really aren't moving. Now, it's not a, a great demonstrator because this end does move up and down. This will work a lot better if you could somehow pluck the string without actually shaking one end of it. But here we're going to turn up the 30. And voila. You have one, two, three, four, five, six times the fundamental. So you got six half wavelengths or three full wavelengths. You trace the top, it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Okay. So that just shows you you can do it in a rope, but it demonstrates some of the features. So here's just a little depiction of what a standing wave would look like. If you could do sort of a, a snapshot of it, you've got these parts that don't move at all. Those are called the nodes. And then you've got these parts that are very far apart in between the nodes, halfway in between the nodes, those are called the anti nodes. And basically what this represents is simply a wave interference phenomenon that is occurring because of reflection, another wave property that we haven't really talked about yet. But if you start over on the left where it first says no and it's got a little arrow and you got a solid red line, think of it as energy going to the towards the right along the red line. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, and then it hits a wall. And what happens at that wall is it reflects back on itself. So the same energy is still in the rope and it actually makes the rope flip upside down because of the, this reflection phenomenon. So you get a, you get a reflection. The rope is now down and then up and then down and then up. So basically what happens is it's the same rope, but you've got this energy going backwards and forwards and that energy is moving in a wave form. When you have two waves energy overlapping at the same place in the same time, that's where you get wave interference, the subject of the previous video lesson. If you get two waves occurring at the same place in the same time and you get interference, then the two waves add together. And the result can be that they add together and amplify one another. That's what's happening at the antinodes or that they actually cancel out the movement of the particle. The energy still goes through, but the particle doesn't move at all. That's what's happening at the node. That's complete destructive interference. So if you actually put your finger right at one of those nodes, the rope would actually still transmit energy without hitting your finger. If you actually pinched it with your finger, the energy would still go right through. Okay. Because it's not moving at those points. So here's a slow motion depiction of it. And again, you can see the red arrows are pointing at the nodes and the blue arrows are pointing at the areas of the antinodes. And if you made this go really fast, you'd see that blurry half wavelength, half wavelength, half wavelength kind of appearance. Here's another depiction of it. If you follow the, um, the blue wave, it goes down, it hits the wall and it bounces back. And then the red wave is its reflection. So that kind of is a, a simulation of what's happening with that fuzzy area is you're actually getting at times uh, wave interference that doesn't add all the way up to the antinode. But then it, it, if you watch it long enough, it, it makes it look like it's got these antinodes and nodes. So here's again, just sort of a, a snapshot depiction of it. If you can shake the rope at just the right frequency, this will only occur. You see, if you can make a half a wavelength, or a full wavelength or one and a half wavelengths or two wavelengths, some multiple of that original fundamental frequency. So uh, you can produce a variety of standing waves by producing multiples of the fundamental frequency. But first you got to figure out what that fundamental frequency is. Now, there's probably some mathematical way to figure that out for a given medium under given conditions, but it's really complicated. So it's a lot easier just to determine it experimentally. You start shaking it and see what happens. So again, if you shook the rope at just the right speed, you could get half of a wavelength between you and the wall. 
that would be your fundamental frequency. And if you shake it twice as fast, you get two half wavelengths. Shake it three times as fast, you get three half wavelengths and so forth. Now, again, the reason why this is of interest to us is that that is what would make, if this were, say, a guitar string instead of a hand shaking a rope, these would be different notes. So that first wave that you can produce, the very first time you can produce a standing wave, if you have two fixed ends, so both ends are, are nailed down like in a guitar string, it's a half a wavelength long, that's called your fundamental. Every time you include another half wavelength by multiplying the fundamental frequency, you get what's called a harmonic or an overtone. Now, those, those terms are, are not exactly interchangeable and I don't want us to get hung up on them. I only introduced them because some of you people might be in the band or you might be a musician. And so you might hear these terms of harmonics and overtones. Essentially, the harmonic is a multiple of the fundamental frequency. And so it's a very precise mathematical definition. The overtone doesn't necessarily have to be a harmonic, especially in certain instruments like drums. They don't really have harmonics. So um, I don't want you to get hung up on the, on the language here. I'm just introducing the fact that you can call it one of two things. So the fundamental or first harmonic for a string instrument, like a guitar, like a piano, um, harp, something like that, the first harmonic is a half wavelength long. It goes between the top and the bottom of the string. All the other harmonics are like, um, you know, if you had if that first one was a C, then the, the second one would be the, the next C, the higher C and so forth. So if you really wanted to get into this, there's a whole science of, of music folks and how this all works. I actually bought a book one time called The Science of Musical Sound, and I started looking at it and realized that it's above my grade level. Okay, it's pretty complicated stuff, but it's very, very interesting to, um, to look at and understand that there is a very big connection between music and science. So standing waves can be produced in the string in a transverse form, but the string vibrates the guitar. The guitar vibrates air inside the soundboard and outside. The air transmits that sound as a longitudinal wave. So it is possible to set up standing waves in air, not just in strings. And that actually leads to another interesting sort of feature. Here's a very slow motion video of a string being plucked and you can see it going back and forth. The wave is traveling down and then back. That would be purely just sort of a blurry string if you saw this in, in uh, real time. And again, what you're seeing right here is this one wave or half of a wave. So that'll be the first harmonic. If you could pluck it faster, you could see the second harmonic, which is a full wavelength, a third harmonic, which is three half wavelengths and so forth. But if you get something that's not a stringed instrument, then what you're doing is producing standing waves in sound. But then a couple of other little interesting features pop up. You see on this thing, like this uh, uh, trumpet shown here, you put your mouth on one end, but the other end is open. It's not fixed. It's not tied down like the two ends of a guitar string. And consequently, you can't produce all the overtones exactly the same. And in fact, the fundamental <clears throat> is not even a full half wavelength. It's not, it's, it's a, if you imagine this wavelength right there, what are you looking at? Okay, you see it go say down, or if you stop motioned it right now, it'd be up, but that's only, that's only one fourth of a wave. So if you have a musical instrument that has one open end, its fundamental is a quarter of a wavelength. 
you cannot produce the second fundamental in those instruments. So all the um, fundamentals, I mean, all the harmonics are going to be odd numbers. So you can get the first harmonic, the third harmonic, and the fifth harmonic. Because that end is open, the, the right-hand side is not fixed down. You can't have it stop in the middle. So you can't have the second harmonic, the fourth harmonic, and so forth, which would require a half a wavelength, a full wavelength, and so forth. Everything has to be an odd number in order for those instruments to make a sound. So they produce a very different tone than something, say, like a flute. Now, a flute, you can actually have two open ends. It may not be all the way on the end. It may be one of the holes along the length of the body. But because you can have two open ends, the first harmonic is um, one full wavelength. So that's the fundamental frequency is a full wavelength. And so the second harmonic then would look like that. And the third harmonic would look like that. And again, I, I'm just showing, I'm just throwing this out there for those of you that are music fans and let you understand that different musical instruments have different sounds for one reason, depending on whether the ends of the vibration are fixed, whether one end is fixed or whether both ends are open ended. You're going to get different fundamentals and different overtones or harmonics based on the features of the instrument. Now, I'm not going to test you on any of that. I'm just throwing it out there for your edification. Okay, so <clears throat> standing waves, kind of interesting feature because that's why it helps us to make music.